So I'm just starting. Um, my name's Laura Hutchison. I work for the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, I kind of head up the compliance team in Scotland. Um, I'm delighted that everybody has joined today and that um, thank you for joining us. I'm really pleased that um, we have so many people who've joined this um, webinar. I'm also really pleased to be joined by such an accomplished and expert panel. We have um, Professor Sharon Cowan, um, Dorothy Bain QC, um, and um, Sandy Brindley um, joining us today um, for this webinar. Um, for those of you who don't maybe don't know who the Equality and Human Rights Commission are or what we do, um, I'll just quickly sort of touch. On that. So we are the equality body or regulator for Great Britain. And what that means is that we promote, encourage, and enforce compliance with equality law, and um, to the Equality Act 2010. We are also one of the four national human rights institutions in the UK, um, and in Scotland we share our remit with the Scottish Human Rights Commission, who we work closely with. Um, this webinar today is brought to you as part of our Transfer of Expertise programme. Um, and through our Transfer of Expertise programme, we hope to increase awareness and understanding of equality in human rights law um, and to improve access to high quality legal advice and support in this area. And ultimately, it's about working, um, it's working towards trying to end unlawful discrimination and violation of human rights. Um, we're running our transfer of expertise event slightly differently um, this year. So we're doing it online because of and doing digital events because of obviously COVID. This is the second one that we have um, we have done. So um, I hope it's a success. But we would really appreciate um, any feedback about how it goes, so we can continue to improve um, the technology and how we run everything to make sure we can get it as smooth as possible. Um, so this is the second one of our um, remote, um, sorry, our second one of our digital events. And the first one we did was on remote hearings and that is available on our YouTube channel. Um, so before I kind of hand over to the panelists and the speakers today, um, I wanted to kind of maybe just touch a bit on why we're doing this event and what our interest is in this area. So much of the Commission's work is about tackling entrenched equalities and long-standing attitudes. Um, and when we're looking at where to focus our resources and our work, um, one of the things we looked at was um, our Is Scotland Fairer and Is Britain Fairer report, which looks about the progress towards um, equality and human rights in Britain and Scotland. Um, and in the most recent one in 2018, um, we highlighted significant problems that were facing the justice system um, and how access, it was clear to us that access to justice in relation to equality and human rights issues has been seriously undermined. And one of the areas we um, saw there being great sort of inequalities and difficulties was about exposing and tackling barriers to justice. Um, and we decided to make that one um, of our strategic priorities. Um, so that is sort of where we're, we're kind of start, the starting point was. So we know there are barriers to justice for those who've experienced gender-based violence and that there are systemic problems with um, sexual offences trials in Scotland as there are in other countries. And there's lots of people who are and organisations who are working really hard to address these problems. Um, so what we wanted to do was um, was to see where we could add value, where we could help um, the work that was already going on in relation to addressing some of the systemic problems in, in the system. Um, and we decided to sort of focus, our, focus some um, efforts and resources um, to do the case literature and case review into the use of sexual history evidence um, in sexual offences trials, because this allowed us to focus on an area where there's not a lot of publicly available information um, or up-to-date research. So we thought we, you know, it was a good area for us to kind of focus resorts and try and understand 
some of the concerns and um, barriers. We also wanted to understand more about how effective the legal protections preventing the inappropriate use of sexual history evidence actually are and whether the um, current practice may be contributing to the disproportionately low conviction rates in rape um, crime, for rape crimes um, and to work towards preventing um, and whether that was working towards preventing access to justice. Um, for um, those who've experienced gender-based violence. I won't go on too much more about the work because Sharon's going to cover it. It was her review. Um, and you'll hear from the panellists as well that the review has come about at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, as some um, some criminal appeal judgments, um, which have where the senior um some of Scotland's most senior judges have raised concerns about the um, introduction of irrelevant information about sexual history evidence and character. Um, they've raised concerns about whether complainers know about or have been given the right to respond to applications to introduce um, such evidence. And they've also raised concerns about the treatment of complainers during lengthy and unnecessary cross examinations during trials. So before I kind of pass on to the first panellist and um, speaker today, Sharon, um, Professor Sharon Cowan. Um, I've just got a couple of housekeeping um, matters that I need to um, let you all know about. So we will be taking questions um, for the speakers, but we'll be doing that at the end of um, each session. So at the end, we'll um, after Sandy has um, spoken, we'll have a half hour um, slot available for questions and answers from the panel. There is a Q&A function, um, which should be to the right of your screen. If you can put your questions as they come to you at any point, just um, would encourage you to, to write um, your questions into that Q&A function or box. And my colleague Cameron, who's working hard behind the scenes, he will collate those questions and we'll put them to the panel um, during the question and answer session. So if you can do that, that would be great. Um, I'm led to believe that there is a default, it, it's set by default to um, send the questions to all of us, so you don't need to um, change any of the settings. Um, it's just also to remind you that we can't see you, you can't be seen just now, but the session is being recorded and um, will be put on our YouTube channel and we may use it for any future communications work that the Commission does. So I think that's everything that I was told that I had to, to let everybody know. So um, without further ado, um, I'll just do a little introduction about Professor Cowan before I hand over. So Professor Cowan is a Professor of Feminist and Queer Legal Studies and the Deputy Head of School at the University of Edinburgh Law School. She carried out the literature and case review for us and produced a series of reports setting out the findings of her, view, of her review, and these are available on our website. Her research interests include gender, law, sexuality, including transgender legal issues and queer legal theory, criminal law, particularly projects on sexual offences, domestic abuse and criminalisation theories, and asylum and refugee law. <clears throat> her current work focuses on sexual history evidence in sexual offences trials in Scotland, and the impact of equality law on transgender people. Alongside all of her academic and research work and achievements, Sharon is a coordinator of the Scottish Feminist Judgments Project, which contributes to a growing global body of work which aims to imagine how important legal cases might have been decided differently if the judge had adopted a feminist perspective. It's a great pleasure to now pass over to Sharon to talk to you about the findings of her review into the use of sexual history evidence in, in sexual offences trials in Scotland. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks very much, Laura. That was a lovely introduction. Hope everyone can hear me. I should just put a small disclaimer in to say that I'm no longer the deputy head of school at Edinburgh uh, Law School. So just in case the current deputy heads are listening, <laughs> that's not me anymore. Um, so thanks for also uh, foregrounding the review that I did for you that we uh, began drafting back in March. And 
Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to have been asked to do this because it's an area that I think for a long time has needed some more scrutiny and more research. And the um, the review that I was asked to do was really to kind of point to uh, what were the gaps in our knowledge um, and any areas of concern and good practice um, that might require further research in Scotland. I did um, provide a little set of slides for this talk, um, which are probably too um, small to see on a screen if you were trying to look at it while you were listening to me. But I think you might, some of you might have it uh, printed out or or on your screens alongside my face. Um, if you don't have the slides, I'll just talk you through um, what it is that I'm, I'm wanting to do today um, and to set up maybe a little bit into what some of the other speakers will talk about after me. So. The aims of the review that uh, I was commissioned to do for the Equality and Human Rights Commission were to produce an analysis of the use and impact of sexual history uh, and character evidence and also private data in sexual offences trials in Scotland, as I say, to sort of highlight the areas that we were needing more research or gaps in knowledge and also uh, areas of good practice. And to do that in the full review, I, I've also outlined uh, the practice in uh, also in England and Wales and in Canada to highlight lessons that we could learn from there. But I'm not going to talk about those today. You can look at those in the full review if you're interested in that later. Um, and the idea was to try to build a platform for uh, bringing governmental and criminal justice and research attention much more fully to this area. Because, um, as I'll say in a second, we haven't had uh, researchers looking in detail at this area since around 2004-2005, which was research published in 2007 by Michelle Berman et al. So it's something that's needed some scrutiny for a while. And so today what I'm going to do is just talk to you a little bit about the context in which the research took place, as well as um, some findings from the review around the relevant Scottish cases and the research that has taken place in Scotland to illustrate those um, gaps uh, in knowledge. I'm also going to say a little bit about what the conclusions of the review were and the remaining questions as I see them um, that need to be answered in our Scottish criminal justice system with respect to sexual offences trials and sexual history evidence. So in terms of the context, I just wanted to say a little bit about the statistics on rape, and this is obviously something that Sandy works on and knows quite a lot more about than I do. But um, I, I did put the uh, review um, into the context of current statistics on sexual offences in Scotland. And the brief thing that I would say about that is that while the general trend in recorded crime statistics in Scotland is that crime has been falling, since um, uh, around 2010, the rate of sexual offences has been climbing uh, over that period. And so while recorded crime is at one of its lowest levels since 1974, sexual crimes are actually at their highest level since records, uh, recorded crime uh, records began in 1971. Um, so that's a very stark divergence between the overall trend for crime and the trend for sexual uh, crimes uh, over that period. And it's not entirely clear why that pattern has emerged. Sometimes the divergence can be explained in part by an increased reporting, particularly where there's been um, uh, historical offences and high media reporting and profiling of those kinds of offences, but it doesn't explain in, in, in its entirety, the divergence between those two figures of overall crime and sexual crime. And I also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the context of the, uh, the recorded crimes, the rates of conviction for um, sexual crimes as opposed to other crimes. Um, so the conviction rate for all crimes um, proceeded against um, is 87%. So that's quite a high rate of conviction for all the crimes proceeded against. For sexual offences, the figure is uh, 69%. 
Um, but the figure for rape and attempted rape proceedings, which are obviously the most serious sexual offences, is a conviction rate of 47%. Um, which is obviously a lot lower than the overall conviction rate of 87%. And that is the lowest of any crime category proceeded against, 47%. So again, just some statistical context to show you um, that there is uh, a low uh, conviction rate as well as a climbing rate of incidents of sexual crimes in Scotland. And again, this is something that um, Sandy has worked on um, in a lot of detail, but a very brief mention of the not proven verdict, which obviously has its own, we could do an entire webinar or possibly 20 webinars on the not proven verdict. So I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but uh, the not proven verdict was uh, used in 40% of rape and attempted rape cases, um, which is quite a high uh, rate of uh, that verdict being used, although a few other crime categories have a high percentage of not proven verdicts. When we look at the figures in more detail, we can see that um, those uh, crime categories slightly skew the figures. So, for example, um, uh, well preceded rapes and attempted rapes have a high acquittal rate of 53%. Homicide has an acquittal rate of 18%. So that means a high not proven rate in homicide looks high, but when you look at the numbers, only seven people received the not proven verdict in homicide as compared to 68 people receiving the not proven verdict in uh, cases of rape and attempted rape. So that's something that we could possibly dig around in a bit more in detail for another day. But that was the uh, context, so the statistical context in which the review was taking place. So what we did was we looked at uh, the legislation and the cases around um, section uh, 274 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which is often known as the Rape Shield provision, and section 275 of the same act, the 1995 Act, which allows for exceptions to that rape shield. So we looked at the provisions and we looked to see how they were being interpreted in practice uh, in the case law. Um, and what I will say, um, first of all, is that we looked at the appeal cases. So obviously some of the trial uh, um, cases are not reported. So we're not looking at um, a representative sample necessarily of all of the rape cases that come to trial, but only at the appeal cases and um, because those are the ones that are reported. And the first thing that we looked at in this respect was um, uh, the arguments that have been taking place around representation for complainers um, in sexual offences trials where there's a section 275 application to bring in sexual history evidence. And again, this is something maybe that Dorothy will talk about in a li little bit more detail. Um, but um, there have been quite strong debates about whether or not um, legal representation for complainers should be allowed in section 27 application hearings. And that takes place against the backdrop of um, cases where uh, representation for complainers has been allowed um, for medical records and mobile phone records. So those are the cases of WF against Scottish ministers, JC Petitioner in 2018, and the more recent case of AR against HM Advocate, all of which opened up the potential for complainers to be legally represented and to have uh, legal aid funding in uh, applications for medical records and mobile phone records. And there's been some discussion about whether or not that should be extended to Section 275 applications for sexual history evidence. Um, and I think there was a recent um, Nobili Afficium case around this, which I, I'm sure someone else will talk to in more detail. But this is certainly a, a debate that we've seen opening up on the back of the cases um, WF and the, and the subsequent cases around representation for complainers. There was an amendment to the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill in 2015 that was tabled 
which would have inserted a provision uh, for legal representation for complainers in section 275 hearings, um, uh, but uh, it uh, was voted down uh, in stage two of the committee's um, hearings, the Justice Committee hearings, uh, stage two of the bill. So we we looked in detail at those debates and um, and the way that the cases had developed the law in this area and asked the question about whether it should be further developed for uh, sexual history evidence complainers. The other set of cases that we looked at that have been happening very recently are around um, dignity, privacy and cross-examination in sexual offences trials. So when you look in detail at the um, the provisions, the legislative provisions, the rape shield provisions, um, one of the things that the court has to look to in assessing whether uh, the evidence uh, is an exception to the restriction under section 274 is whether um, the evidence that um, the defense wants to raise um, is in line with an appropriate protection of the complainer's dignity and privacy. And the way that that has been uh, it developed and interpreted in the case law um, is very important and very uh, topical. In in last in the last two to three years, there have been a number of very important cases that have have developed this idea of the complainer's um, dignity um, and privacy. And the six uh, most recent cases that we looked at in detail for the review started with um, Dreghorn in two thousand and fifteen and uh, ended with the most recent one, CH, against HMA in 2020. And without going into great detail of every single one of those six cases, what I would say is the common theme emerging from those appeal cases is that the, um, the Lord Justice Clark and the Lord President have made very strong statements about the way that the uh, courts should be interpreting the protection of the dignity or privacy of the complainer, particularly pointing to failures of the Crown to challenge inadmissible evidence or uh, the trial judge to intervene regarding um, a balance of fairness to the parties, whether that's struck or not, and also um, administrative delays, administrative and communication problems, and in particular, um, the way that uh, Section 275 applications have been drafted, uh, sometimes incompletely, uh, by the defence. So these are all issues that have been picked up by the most uh, senior judges in the appeal court around interpreting dignity, privacy and cross-examination of the complainer. So those were the cases that we looked at that were coming out of the, the legislation in the most recent developments in the case law. The next step was to look at the research in the area, and it's very annoying when researchers say, my research shows that more research is necessary, but that was very much the fundamental finding of this review was that there is a dearth of research in Scotland in this area. There, there is, generally speaking, a lot to be done in research terms in many jurisdictions on this, on this topic, but Scotland definitely is uh, lagging behind other jurisdictions in terms of the amount of research available on which we can form any solid, robust conclusions about what is happening in practice. So the last piece of research published, as I've mentioned earlier, was Michelle Berman and her team, who reported in 2007. Um, that was subsequent to an earlier uh, research uh, study in the 1990s completed by Beverly Brown and her team. and. Berman and, Berman and her team in 2007 reported an increase in sexual history applications after the introduction of the restrictive legislative provisions. And part of the reason for that has been explained by the fact that the new framework under the provisions we have now required what would previously have been verbal applications to be made in writing. So clearly there was going to be an increase in applications made in writing. But again, that doesn't entirely explain the increase in sexual history applications after the new legislation. So just very briefly from their findings, they found that of 231 
sexual offences cases indicted to the High Court in a 12-month period, 72% of them included a Section 275 application. Um, and of the rape trials that they looked at, specifically 76% of those included such applications. So they found quite a high rate of um, applications in those cases. What we found since then is only very small snapshots of data have been available. So one of my colleagues at Edinburgh, Eamon Keane, and his colleague, Tony Convery, did a freedom of information request to the uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services in 2019 to try to get a sense of how many Section 27 applications, Section 275 applications there were. And they did get a, a flat number, but of course it's really difficult to put that into context um, in terms of what those uh, applications involved and how many of them were allowed in part or in full if they were challenged, etc. The Inspectorate of Prosecution uh, did a three-month monitoring exercise in 2000 and early 2017, looking at um, 275 applications, and they found 14 applications in that three-month period, but it's not clear how many cases were involved, so we can't say what rate that was of applications. Um, and they found that of those 14 applications, the Crown did not oppose 12 of them. So only two of the 14 applications were opposed by the Crown. Now, without more detailed information, it's impossible to offer any nuanced, anal any nuanced analysis of, of that. We can't say whether any of those figures are higher than lower than what Ber uh, Berman and her team found. Um, and uh, likewise, the Scottish uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice released three month snapshot figures in 2016, um, which again, a very uh, short period of time showing uh, that Crown prosecutors are not challenging applications to introduce sexual history evidence. Now, I'll just say again, as a researcher, I have to, have to point out the methodological limitations of all of this because we can't tell very much from these figures. We don't know if that's representative of sexual offences trials as a whole. We don't know why uh, they're not challenging applications. Um, and the Crown Office does not routinely at the moment collect data on uh, the, two sections, the Section 275 applications. So we can't tell in, in, any, in any detail what is actually going on there, hence the need to point to uh, more research. So a more systematic data capture of these uh, issues is obviously necessary. And of course, I've asked the question on the slide, if you're following that slide 13, but what is the content of the applications? Because all this does is present a statistical backdrop. It doesn't tell us anything about the content of those applications, how they're drafted, whether or not they're sticking to the, um, the rules for making an application, um, or are not being done properly, as has been pointed out in some of the more recent cases that I've spoken about at, at the appeal court. So just to sum up there then, um, the lessons that we might have learned from other jurisdictions and the conclusions we might draw from this um, is that we don't systematically capture data and um, other jurisdictions do a slightly better job of that. Um, the Ministry of Justice has just proposed a new digital platform for recording uh, accurate statistics on the use of sexual history evidence. Um, we also need some kind of review of Crown uh, policy and practice on managing sexual offences cases through reporting uh, from reporting to trial, as has been uh, suggested in by the CPS and undertaken by the CPS in England and Wales. And we could also look to um, independent legal re uh, representation of um, complainers as has been uh, explored and brought in in Canada and Ireland. So in terms of what the remaining questions are for Scotland, then I would say that the review of the current management of cases, um, particularly around communication with complainers and consent from complainers for use of data, um, better record keeping, regular reporting of that uh, data, um, a review of Crown defence and judicial practice at preliminary hearing and trial stage on the introduction and challenging and content of sexual history uh, applications, 
um, and the potential for uh, reform regarding uh, ILR or independent legal representation for complainers. There's a whole other conversation to be had about juries, but that's not for today. Um, but all of this, as I said earlier, points to the need for much more detailed, uh, in-depth, robust, rigorous research. Thanks very much. That's great. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, before I move on to Dorothy Bain QC, I just wanted to clarify that the question and answer session is at the end of um, all this, the speakers today, just in case that wasn't clear. So we have kind of set aside around 30 minutes to have that question and answer session at the end. But now I would like to um, move on to our second speaker today. Um, so Dorothy Bain QC is a leading Scottish lawyer and became an advocate in 1994 in Queen's Council in 2007. She has worked as a prosecutor for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service becoming the Principal Advocate Deputy in 2009. She was the first woman to hold this post, which is the highest ranking prosecutorial, that's difficult for me to say, prosecutorial <laughs> um, position in Scotland. Her work led to the formation of Scotland's National Sexual Crimes Unit in 2009. Given her vast and high level of experience in this area, Dorothy is frequently instructed in cases concerning sexual abuse. She is on the Commission's Panel of Advocates, is the Serving Chair of the Police Appeals Tribunal Scotland and is a Special Counsel, a position appointed by the Lord President. I'm delighted that Dorothy can be with us this morning, I know she's very busy, to talk to us about one of her recent cases where she took a petition to the High Court of Judiciary for a rape complainer about her right to be heard before a judge decided whether to allow a Section 275 application to introduce evidence about her sexual sexual history and character. Over to you, Dorothy. Thanks. You're on mute, Dorothy, I think. If you could just turn it on today. Thanks. Is that it? Okay. So I've been asked to speak about the case of RR against Her Majesty's Advocate, rape crisis intervening in which I appeared for the petitioner when her application to the Nobili Officium of the High Court was heard before a five-judge bench this August of this year. Uh, for those who don't know, the Nobili Officium is a general power of superintendence available to deal with circumstances that are extraordinary or unforeseen or where no remedy is provided for by law. In this case, RR alleges that she was raped in August of 2018. During the rape, she sustained significant injuries to her body and an internal injury to her mouth. Her case was indicted to the High Court and four months after, after a 275 hearing, she was advised for the first time that the application had been heard in court and the fact that it had been granted. It was a case in which the Crown had, in fact, opposed the application on grounds of relevancy, yet the preliminary hearing judge had allowed questioning that meant she'd be able to be cross-examined and the accused permitted to lead evidence relative to undated messages or discussions in which she said she liked hard sex and was adventurous and a meeting one month before the rape, when she engaged in sexual intimacy, falling short of intercourse, but including stating that she wanted to be spanked. The accused had lodged a special defence of consent. And RR, quite distressed, after having received the information about the application and the grant by the Crown, consulted uh, her rape crisis advisor, and thereafter her solicitor, and indicated that the things that were being said to have happened had never happened. There'd been no such discussions or texts or sexual intimacy of the type alleged. And she was deeply distressed at the prospect of being exposed to these humiliating questions at her forthcoming trial. Understanding that the evidence was irrelevant or collateral, uh, 
uh, if it's irre irrelevant or collateral to the offence, the common law says that that evidence is inadmissible, as these questions would be. Also understanding that in terms of 274 and 275 of the 1995 Act, questioning or evidence which is designed to show that a complainer is not of a good character has engaged in sexual behaviour, not forming parts of the events libelled, or has at a point remote from the events behaved in a manner from which an inference of consent or lack of credibility or reliability is not generally admissible. Understanding these statutory provisions and the protections of the common law, we took the view that these particular questions that I've referred to were in fact inadmissible. Uh, were irrelevant and were in breach of the rape shield protections. So the view is taken that the preliminary hearing judge had been wrong when these parts of the application had been granted. The difficulty was though that the Crown hadn't appealed the decision and on the face of it RR had no remedy in law. She was a witness, she's not a party to the proceedings and she's not a party to the 275 process. There appeared to be no mechanism through which she had a right to be heard or to be participating in the 275 process. So what to do? Understanding that why the Slovenia and Rovic against Croatia provide that cross-examination of a complainer in a rape case is an interference of her Article 8 rights. As the court observed in those cases, cross-examination of a rape victim in court is highly sensitive as it necessarily reveals information about the most intimate aspects of the victim's life. We took the view that RR's Article 8 rights were engaged when this 275 application was allowed because it related to conduct remote from the events forming part of the rape. We also took the view that her Article 8 rights had not been respected and that in law she was entitled to have these effectively recognised. This hadn't happened. And so it was in this situation that we brought the petition to the Nobilia Ficium, asking the High Court in its superintendent rule to provide her with a legal remedy. The case was argued under the Victims Directive and the Victims Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 and separately under Article 8 of the Convention. It was argued that the complainer had the right to be notified of the application, to make representations to the court before the application was granted, and that this included a right to be heard and a right to instruct a legal representative at the hearing. The argument was advanced on the text of the Victims Directive. It was also uh, advanced on the anomaly that complainers currently have that right to be heard before their sensitive personal records or their mobile telephones are seized, but no such right when equally private, perhaps more private matters, are the subject of Section 275 applications. It was also advanced on the basis that, basis that Canada and Ireland place the right to be heard on applications for disclosure of personal records and applications on sexual history questioning on the same footing. So what did the court find? The court found that while there was no right to be heard under the Act, the 2014 Act, and under Article 8 of the Convention, complainers have a right to be informed about the 275 application and to make their position known to the court through the Crown. We find that paragraphs 47 and 50 of the judgment. The court said that the comparative materials relied on served only to highlight that Parliament in Scotland had elected not to introduce a similar system, giving the right to be heard in Scotland. And that since RR had not been asked for her views on the 275 application that was argued, the decision of the High Court granting those parts of the application that I refer to 
was quashed and remitted for consideration of RR's position uh, after it had been obtained by the Crown and presented in court. So the outcome was in effect successful, but not to the extent that had been hoped. The decision was quashed where previously it was thought there was no, pre, uh, no remedy and the High Court directed that the Crown had a duty to consult complainers and to take on board what they were saying and to report their objections to the court. The court's judgment has in fact now taken effect and they have approved changes to the forms that the High Court preliminary system, uh, hearing system has. And they have to ensure through these changes that the court is made aware uh, by a recording in the form that the complainer knows about the 275 application, she knows of its content, she's been invited to comment on the accuracy of the allegations within it, and she's been invited to state any objections she might have to the application. And the, the Lord Justice General and the Lord Justice Clark have approved the change to the forms that the Council and the Crown are required to complete before submission to the court and before hearings on these applications take place. So the, the court has to be absolutely satisfied that these protections, in order to meet uh, the protections required under the 2014 Act to, to participate effectively, and to protect Article 8 rights are given effect to. There are positive changes, however, how much change they make in substance is questionable. I would observe that at this stage, that one of our submissions on why uh, only a right to be heard, not just a right to be informed is sufficient for Article 8, is that the Crown and complainers' interests will not always align. The court implicitly recognised that in its comment that once the Crown has presented the complainer's position to the court on the 275 application, the Crown will nevertheless be free to comment on both the petitioners, that's RR's position, as they see fit. The essential position remains therefore as it was before the changes brought about by this petition. The Crown cannot take instructions from the complainer or provide her with legal advice. They can't interpret her position as it may unfold in light of submissions or in light of the way the evidential landscape inevitably changes during investigation and preparations for trial. That is no sense of criticism of the Crown, but it is the reason that was advanced for separate legal representation. Looking at the judgment generally then, for my part, I also consider there's some elements that are worthy of further reflection and perhaps future challenge. In the time available today, it's not really possible to explore any of these in detail, but I think I could legitimately summarize them in this way. The court really didn't address the anomaly that was at the root of the case, which was complainers whose sensitive personal records and mobile telephones are sought, have the right to be heard precisely because the disclosure would interfere with their Article 8 rights. But complainers who are asked personal questions about their sexual history, and which the court accepts will also interfere, interfere with their Article 8 rights, do not. In relation to the comparative materials, the court found that they indicated a direction of travel and only served to highlight the fact that Parliament hadn't made legislative change here. But that wasn't the reason they were relied on in argument. It was because Ireland and Canada recognised there was no difference in principle between disclosure of personal records and sexual history questioning. They both engaged the private life of the complainer and they both entitled the right to be heard on each type of application. That doesn't indicate a direction of travel, rather recognises and removes the anomaly of allowing complainers to be heard on one type of application, but not the other. In relation to the uh, Article 8 
uh, um, argument that was advanced. Paragraph 54 of the judgment is worth consideration. I don't want to quote it here because we've not got time, but essentially what the court said is that given the protections which are built into criminal procedure, both at common law and under the Act, a court ought, if it correctly applies the law, to be able to ensure that Article 8 rights are duly respected whilst ensuring an accused right to a fair trial. The upshot of this, the court said, is that quite apart from Section 13D of the 2014 Act, in order to respect Article 8 rights, the court has to be given information about the complainant's position. But they said this, neither the statutory provisions or Article 8 carry with them the right for the complainer to be convened as a party. In the absence of statutory intervention, the system of criminal prosecution remains adversarial, one between the Crown and the accused. The complainer's status is still that of a witness. That position, uh, I think, can reasonably be challenged because it doesn't address the submission that was made, that without the right to be heard, the present system is, sufficient, is not sufficient for Article 8. And it overlooked many of the reasons set out as to why that was so. And it didn't address the question posed in WF at paragraph 39, that if the complainer is not given an opportunity to be heard, how is the court to be carrying out the balancing exercise required of it? And in any event, um, the court found that in the absence of the statutory basis for the right to be heard, they determined that none existed, but that was in complete um, opposition in a sense, or completely uh, ran contrary to the way in which the court approached this matter in uh, the divisional court's decision in RV against the Crown at Stafford. Because in that particular case, is that uh, in the absence, it was found that in the absence of any procedural requirement of the parties to intimate uh, an application for recovery, that didn't determine whether or not the individual was a party to the proceedings. In short, the court held that the court had to look beyond the national procedural rules and the procedural uh, provisions of the domestic uh, setup and look to the procedural requirements of Article 8 itself. And the court summarised the position in this way in RB against Stafford Court. The decision making process must be such as to secure that the views of those whose rights are an issue are made known and duly taken account of. What has to be determined is whether having regard to the particular circumstances of the case, and notably the serious nature of the decisions to be taken, the persons whose rights are an issue have to be involved in the decision making process, seen as a whole, to agree sufficient to provide them with the requisite protection of their interests. For the reasons that we set out, uh, our submissions to the court was that it was only that the right to be heard met that requirement. The court also dealt with the Victims Directive and there were interesting arguments surrounding that. Um, uh, it's, we don't really have time to go into those today, but what essentially the court did was they found, it considered as a directive and found that it was clear and contained a very general right to be heard during criminal proceedings, but not a right to be party to them. And the court also observed that it was, um, uh, that when it was not argued that the legislation had failed to transpose the directive, then it was to the legisl legislation, not the directive that the court should look. Effectively, what the court said was that the 2014 Act, although it set out to um, implement the directive, hadn't done so effectively, so as to transpose uh, and give effect to the right to be heard in the proceedings for a complainer. And I think that what's questionable is the way the court approached it, which is looking 
firstly at the directive and then at the transposing legislation and deciding that the transposing legislation it was all that required to be looked at, rather than looking at both the directive and the transposing legislation itself, where in the circumstances, the Justice Secretary had given evidence to Parliament indicating that the purpose of the legislation was to give effect to the directive. So that's another interesting aspect that's probably worthy of further examination, as in fact may be the provisions of the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 themselves. So these are rather technical aspects of the judgment that are worthy of um, thorough academic analysis and probably future debate in court in other cases and, uh, and perhaps in other forums. So the case found there was a right to participate. That was an important principle that was established by the five judge bench, and it was a good step forward. They didn't hold that there was a right to be heard. And the case raises some very interesting issues over whether or not uh, uh, the uh, Article 8 protections available and the directive and the act have probably been given effect to by reason of this decision. That's something that we can discuss. So it's a, a short of time, and I don't want to take up much more time, but it is a very, it was an important case to take. It was one that was taken by a young woman who found the whole process very, very challenging, uh, very anxious about the whole matter, and credit really has to be given to her for the, um, the determination that she had to see this through and the real sense of injustice that she felt by what had happened to her. And for me, this particular um, webinar today is very encouraging in that a discussion that's been brought to the fore by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. It's very important to see the prosecution of gender-based violence in the prism of equality issues. It is a question of equality framing gender-based violence as a human rights violation is an important conceptual shift that we all have to take on board. And we have to understand that the case law from the European Court of Human Rights has categorized, has categorized gender-based violence as a form of discrimination against women and a discrimination of, on the basis of sex. And on that basis, it does engage public authorities' duties under the Equality Act uh, and the relevant legislation to ensure that the prosecution of sexual crime meets their obligations under the Equality Act. And so it's a bigger argument than just a three-dimensional argument that was always uh, in place between what is um, thought to be a complainer's position and the position of the Crown and the accused before the court. It's more than a three-dimensional uh, argument now. There are victims' rights enshrined under the directive, but there are bigger issues for public authorities under the Equality Act and the relevant legislation. So that, that would be all I wish to say at this point. Thank you very much, Dorothy. That was um, really interesting summary of the uh, of the case um, and a, a brilliant sort of um, conclusion to it as well. Thank you very much. Um, before I move on to our final speaker, um, I just wanted to um, remind um, attendees that if you could type your questions into the Q and A box during the presentations, then that gives my colleagues Cameron and Charlotte behind the scenes some time to kind of pull them together for the end so that we can get through as many as we can. Um, but um, I'd like to move on now to our final speaker today, who's Sand Sandy Brindley. Sandy is the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland, and she has, through her work over the past 17 years, led the development of services and high-profile campaigns for survivors to have vital access to the support and justice that they need. Sandy has and continues to be at the forefront of a wide range of initiatives to raise awareness of sexual violence, challenge public attitudes and press for legal change to improve survivors' experiences of the criminal justice system. Of her many achievements, Sandy played a pivotal role in redefining the crime of rape to include male rape and the provision of a much-needed statutory definition of consent. 
She led Rape Crisis Scotland in intervening in the landmark judicial review, which improved the privacy rights of rape complainers by giving them a right to access legal aid to oppose defence attempts to seek to disclose their personal medical records. Alongside her day-to-day -day work at Rape Crisis Scotland, Sandy was instrumental in establishing the Scottish Women's Rights Centre, a groundbreaking initiative that provides free legal advice to survivors of gender-based violence and which aims to improve women's legal rights through strategic litigation. If we were to overcome the barriers to justice and eradicate violence against women and girls, we must understand the experiences and the needs of survivors and make this central to the decisions that we need to make about what needs to change. So, on that basis, I'm very pleased that Sandy can be with us today to talk about the impact um, of the use of sexual history and character evidence on survivors. Sandy, over to you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and thanks very much for that, Laura. Um, at Rape Crisis Scotland, we run a national advocacy project which supports people through the criminal justice system for reporting sexual crime. We have 30 advocacy workers based across the country. And what that means is, importantly, that complainers have support to navigate what can be a very difficult system. But also, I think that we at Rape Crisis Scotland re really have the, the best insight we've ever had about what the issues are facing complainers trying to seek justice following sexual crime. Um, in, in relation to sexual history and character evidence, what, what we know through our work is that the prospect of having your private life being brought up in court can deter people from reporting sexual crime in the first place. It can add to the trauma of the prospect of giving evidence and if it does happen, it definitely adds to the sense of violation that complainers report experiencing through the process of giving evidence in court. And I really want to pay tribute, as Dorothy did, to the individual women who have taken cases. And I'm thinking specifically of WAF, who really, really say, say the, the, the right to have representation and to be heard when your sensitive medical records have been accessed. So WF, but also RR in the most recent case, I think these are women who, in the most difficult of circumstances, have seen their own criminal cases delayed and delayed significantly to try to assert a right to be heard. Um, and re really, I think what they're trying to do is make things better for other people coming after them. And really, I think this should not be a burden that falls on the shoulders of individual women. This is about a systemic lack of protection of human rights, I, I would say. And I, I think it should be the government who are showing this burden, burden, or if not, human rights bodies. And I, I think that is why, as Dorothy says, it's particularly welcome to see the Equality and Human Rights Commission um, leading on this work just now. Um, we've also seen um, legal practitioners um, such as Dorothy, um, I really would want to say just how um, what a difference um, her work has made in taking on cases like this. Her and Claire Mitchell and other legal practitioners who have worked tremendously, often pro bono, at least initially pro bono, to try and improve the protection of complainers' um, rights. And I, I think that really is much appreciated. Um, we've also seen a number of academics, so Sharon and her most recent work with the Quantum Rights Commission and previous work, but also Fiona Ray, um, formerly of Dundee Law School, and Michelle Berman and Una brooks Hay, and other academics who have all worked to try and, and really bring shine a light in what's happening in sexual crime um, trials. But despite all of this, and despite, I would say, some very strong um, words from the appeal court, it is clear that there, there remains a problem in how um, sexual offence complainers are treated and specifically how their privacy is protected when they seek justice in Scottish courts following um, a sexual crime. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context about how complainers experience the process of um, rape and sexual offence trials in Scotland, because this is the context in which they're having to contemplate having their sexual history or character being brought up in court. So the, the most common description 
that we hear from complainers to describe their experience of giving evidence in a sexual offence trial as horrific. They say it's a horrific experience. They describe intense feelings of vulnerability and trauma. And this particularly relates, I think, unsurprisingly, to cross-examination. So I just wanted to give four, four quotes. I, 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 could, I could give many, but just four, four quotes from complainers about how they feel about the process um, of being in court. Um, so one woman says, without doubt, it was one of the most awful experiences of my life. I was shaken and terrified. The judge and advocate deputy made it easier as I felt they were supporting me. The defence was awful, asking or telling me I was a liar over and over. It felt like it was one decibel under shouting at me. Another complainer says, it was terrible. I don't know how to explain it. The accused lawyer was terrible to me. I know it's a job, but I wouldn't dream of saying the things that were said to me to anyone. I was told that nothing could have happened because I didn't shout and scream. This made me so angry to be called a liar. She kept going over and over the same things, and I didn't know why this kept being allowed. I would never go through giving evidence again, and I fully understand now why people don't report it. A third complainer said it was horrific. I feel like it psychologically damaged me. You just have a man beating down on you and no one steps in to protect you. And finally, <clears throat> a fourth complainer said it was all, all, honestly almost as bad as the rape. I felt so exposed and vulnerable and small. So I, th I think uh, in this context, the, the prospect of intensely private aspects of your life being brought up in front of the judge, the jury, lawyers, and the man who's accused of raping you can be very, very daunting and very distressing. And I think it's striking how alone and unprotected complainers see the feel. So Sharon spoke in her presentation about a number of appeal cases where the Crown haven't objected um, to the leading of um, sexual history evidence. And our, our experience, this is not uncommon. So our, our experience really is that the cost of seeking justice currently in Scotland following a rape or sexual assault is too high. Even where there's been a guilty verdict, complainers say to us they would never go through it again. So, I think then the key question for us becomes how, how, how do we improve complainers' experience and better protect complainers' rights throughout this process? So cu currently, for complainers that we are supporting, the process is characterised by uncertainty, vulnerability and a lack of agency. Um, I think a key development that is needed is independent legal representation, which has been mentioned by other speakers. Certainly in relation to contested areas of privacy in terms of evidence, and by that I, I mean specifically in um, sexual history or character evidence. Um, it is clear to me that complainers cannot rely on the Crown to protect their privacy interests. And in saying this, I don't mean any disrespect to the Crown. There are incredibly hard-working prosecutors out there who are really, really dedicated to doing the right thing. But at times, I think there is an intrinsic conflict for the Crown in that they are representing the public interest. They cannot represent directly complainers' interests. Um, so prior to um, the RR case that uh, Dorothy spoke about, which has already led to um, changes, um, up, up until la last week, complainers were not even routinely informed an application had been made prior to a judge ruling on it, never mind having their views sought. And what, what this can mean, because friendly hearings where um, 275 applications are, are decided upon are open to the press. What that means is the press can know, um, like journalists can know that a 275 application has been made in a case, but the complainer doesn't know. I, I just do not think that is, that is right. So where complainers are informed that an application has been made, and so, sometimes, as in the RR case, this is some time after a decision has been made and a judge has ruled on it, complainers may leave meetings with the Crown completely confused about what and has not been granted. 
I think the, the prospect, as I say, of this type of evidence being laid can be very emotive, very distressing and very difficult. And at the very least, I would say complainers need legal advice and representation to help them understand and navigate that process. Because what we know is that the more certainty you can give to complainers on what is a very, very difficult and daunting process, the more you're going to alleviate at least some of the trauma associated with that, that process. And I think also that there's a real challenge for us in how do you give complainers a sense of agency in a system that is not designed to give agency to what is, in effect, complainers are just witnesses to a crime committed against them. And I think it's really striking when you listen to Miss M, who some of you may know her case, she took a civil case, a successful civil case, um, after getting an unproven verdict in her criminal case. And when she speaks about the difference between the two systems, the criminal and the civil system, it's not just that the outcome was positive in the civil system, it's that in taking civil action, because she was a party and had direct representation, it really made her feel that she had some agency in relation to her, her own rape, and that this really did make all the difference. And I'm not suggesting at this stage that we make complainers parties, but I do think when it's very emotive and difficult issues, such as your sexual history being brought up, potentially, complainers absolutely need their own legal representation. So I, I also wanted to, to say briefly about WF, which was the case, may not for you know, at the start of 2016, that introduced a right of legal representation um, when the defence or the Crown, well, the defence particularly, are seeking um, complainers' sensitive private records, which is often medical records, but also other records as well. Um, and I think the, the key thing for us, or what we learned from this case, is that rights are not meaningful unless they are easily realised. So the judgment by Lord Glenny and WAF, I think, was very, very positive. It recognised that there's a fundamental article, article eight breach in having your medical records accessed in this way. But what what didn't happen after WAF was a proper process to be put in place to make sure that complainers actually received intimation that an application was being made, that they had a right to legal representation and that they were put in touch with the proper legal representation. So what happened in one case that we were involved in, we, sp we spent months trying to find out why a complainer didn't receive intimation that the defence were trying to get her records. What had happened was just the hearing went, went ahead, and as far as the judge was concerned, a complainer had chosen not to be represented. But what actually happened, because there was no proper a process put in place for intimation, for letting the complainer know um, that she had a right to uh, object. Um, the defence had just sent the intimation to the police station. The police station got a huge volume of mail. They just didn't recognise the name and they rejected it. So what that meant is you, you have this lofty right to be heard, but on the ground, the complainer is not being told about that right. And if she's not told about it, and also if she's not put in touch with appropriate representation, because it's not good enough, I think, just to see a complainer in the most difficult of circumstances, who's maybe never instructed a lawyer before, go to the Law Society website and find a lawyer. It's, it's just not good enough. So we really need to make sure that there's proper processes put in place to support complainers to realise these rights. Otherwise, they don't, they don't mean anything at all. Um, so it's only this month, on the 12th of October, that a proper process was put in place for intimation and share of court cases. And when you think that is four years after WAF, I do think there's a real lesson to learn there if we're thinking about uh, introducing ILR for sexual history. I also wanted, on that note, to briefly um, refer to a case that both Sharon and Dorothy mentioned, which was the Lord Tyre judgment around the right to be heard when the defence want a complainer's mobile phone. Again, that was a really, really positive um, judgment from Lord Tyre. But what happened in that case was just, as far as I can tell, because we were involved in, in the case, or otherwise I think it would have been a different outcome in terms of putting the complainer in touch with adequate legal representation. What happened is just she, she approached a lawyer and they said there's nothing that can be done. But it's really what should have happened was um, a, a special application to Scottish ministers to make legal aid available. And if they didn't, to judicially review that. 
Um, so I, I think there's real issues about how, how do you make sure that what happens or, or what is set out in paper is a right actually becomes something that makes a difference to complainers. And there, there is a gap there that I, I really think we, we, we need to give serious consideration to. But for me, the most fundamental lesson from WF was about um, this, the government's responsibility um, to protect or to make sure we have a system in place that protects complainers' rights. Because I, I, I really thought it was a disgrace what happened in the W. FK. So we, we have been aware of the issue of medical records for a long time. We were interested in it, um, including human rights bodies. So it then fell to this one individual woman in the most difficult of cases to try um, and assert a right when the defence wanted the entirety of her medical records. Um, and an application was made to Scottish. There was no provision for legal aid at all because she had no right to be heard. Um, and the Scottish government just said she's got no right to be heard and didn't make legal aid available. So I, I do think there is something that we need to consider here about what is the responsibility of governments rather than just putting it onto individual women or individual complainers to try and assert their rights um, in what are very, very difficult circumstances. And the last um, point I want to make um, is just that I think we need to think about the role that sexual history and character evidence plays in sexual crime trials and why the defence use it or why they want to use it. Um, fundamentally, I think this is about jury attitudes and appealing to jury attitudes. Often, in my view, what is happening in rape trials is about a misogynistic interpretation uh, of women's sexuality and that's what has been played out over the course of a rape trial um, and that if we don't address attitudes to sexual violence and attitudes to women's sexuality we're going to achieve very little in the defence but we'll keep wanting to use sexual history evidence so we need a fundamental shift in attitudes I would say but that will take many generations um, and I don't think we should be writing off um, people's chance of justice in the meantime and I do think there is an urgent question for us about the use of juries and rape trials. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's great, really, really great um, to get your experience and your views and um, to set out some of the big, big challenges I think that we still have in front of us. Um, we have 15 minutes left and the questions have been um, flying in. Um, so I'll move quickly on to them um, and try and uh, get through as many as we can. I think um, the first question that I would like to put um, to you, which is about kind of links a bit to your point, um, Sandy, about why the defence use or try to introduce sexual history evidence. Um, Sorry, I'm now trying to find it on my um, on my bit. So there's a question on my on my screen. There's a question about is the purpose of the sexual history inf information request predominantly aimed at discrediting the complainer? Um, would anyone like to to kind of share their views on that question? Yeah, I would just say yes. <laughs> okay, I, I, I don't think that would be the right way to to categorise it. I think that um, the applications are made in order to uh, give, in order to get around the statutory prohibition where the circumstances would legally permit. But I think that the difficulty with the legislation has been that it's not been properly enforced and that what what happens is that um, many of the questions that are posed are, uh, are that are proposed are irrelevant and they're irrelevant because they don't relate to the particular offense as libeled and the the, the procedure was brought in because of parliamentary policy uh, and Parliament recognized, that it was necessary to exclude irrelevant questioning relating to consent because this irrelevant questioning was based on 
rape myths such as if the woman consented before, she's well, she's bound to consent on another occasion, or if she did this uh, two days before the rape, she's bound to have done it on this occasion. So the the purpose, some of the irrelevant questioning is certainly a reinforcement of rape myths, and it's cert those certainly uh, influence the jury, there's no doubt about that. But whether or not it's a deliberate attempt to do what the question asks, I I'm not so sure that I would agree with that, but, but Sandy obviously has more experience in these things than I do. But I think that um, the, the legislation is there to exclude questions that essentially reinforce rape myths and the difficulties being that the judges hearing these cases haven't actually enforced the legislation properly and trial counsel have seen that as the way in which these applications are dealt with. So hopefully with the strong line that the court has taken in the recent five judge bench case CH, which is well worth a read, uh, we will see that that has really cemented the line that's been developing in relation to relevancy that's uh, and which is a very important way of dealing with these applications sandy do you want to add anything or sorry sorry, I'm not, I'm sorry looking at the Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say that I um just I just wanted to echo some of the things that Dorothy had said, and I, I think maybe that what's happened in the past is that the application of the law, as as Dorothy was saying, hasn't been quite as robust, and so maybe there's just some practices that have developed over time and habits around how applications are written or how they're approached in the court, which hasn't been honouring the spirit of the law and that that practice has developed over time so that, that that's um, seen as a way of of potentially um, undermining or, or contradicting the testimony of the of the complainer. I, I, I think that it's possible that it is sometimes used as a deliberate, deliberate ploy, but it's also I think the case that there's a strong disagreement about whether some of these types of evidence are actually relevant or not. Like there are strong disagreements about whether the fact that you had done a specific act in the past or in the immediate aftermath of the alleged event, whether that's relevant. There just there are some deep disagreements about that. I, I think um, it, it is de definitely right that there have been real issues in the implementation of the legislation and that the appeal court has had a significant impact, really negatively. I, I, I was seeing the early days of the legislation and more positively now. So in the early days of the legislation, we had cases like Kinnan, Cummings, Ronald, that, that I, I thought really, really undermined the intent of the, the parliament in legislating. The intent of the, the parliament was about outdated notions about women's sexuality. And in and, and the main, it is in the main, um, women's sexuality we're, we're, we're talking about here have no place in the course of rape trials. And a, and a lot of those early judgments, I think what the appeal court did was undermine um, first instance judges who were trying to take quite a robust approach. And I think that then obviously had an impact on practitioners who wouldn't object because they thought there's no point because it wouldn't um, it, it, it wouldn't then um, succeed. So I think that did have a big impact um, on the um, implementation of the legislation. And what I see now is the appeal court is really trying to take a, a much stronger stance on um, trying to make sure the intent of the legislation is, is actually um, being implemented properly. And I, I think what that then means is that, that there really is a culture change um, that, that is underway just now, or that I hope is underway just now um, in response to those appeal judgments. But really, I, I think the difficult is that we, we just, we, we don't really, apart from the appeal judgments, which is only a very, very small number of cases, apart from those appeal judgments, we don't really know what is happening in Scottish trials in relation to sexual history. We hear lots of anecdotal information from legal practitioners. We hear what complainers um, experiences, but, but fundamentally what, what we need is, is proper research into what the picture is now compared to what it was um, all, all those years ago with the last evaluation. That's great. Um, and if people haven't um, read the um, reports that um, Sharon has written and that are published on our websites, um, some of the things that the Commission is calling for is more publicly available information routinely collected and published 
as well as more research. Um, and also sort of a, uh, we're also calling for an independent review of how um, the, how applications for um, two seven five actual applications are kind of managed by the crown. Um, so um, our reports are available on our website. You can read that. I'm just um, there's quite a few questions that are around the participation um, of complainers in the system and about independent legal representation. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, uh, just um, put one to the um, panel that I think kind of sums up some of the questions. Um, does the panel think that the situation would be best improved by ILR in isolation or by a more robust observation of the terms of 274, 275 by defence, prosecution and court? Or will the former, so ILR, be the only way to bring about the latter? Um, Sharon, do you want to go for that one? <laughs> uh, um... Oh, well, you know, I think actually this is such a massive issue. It's never going to be solved by just one thing. I think what Sandy said right at the end there about culture shift is what's really necessary. And sometimes the culture shift comes before the rule change and sometimes the rule change comes first. And again, as Sandy said earlier, even after WF, it took a long time for that change on paper to actually take effect in practice. So I think ILR would have a really positive effect in lots of ways, but I think we also need a robust observation of 274, 275 um, by the Defence Prosecution and Court, and we also need a cultural change around um, stereotypes, around what, you know, what rape looks like, and we need potentially more work on juries to figure out what the heck is going on there. You know, there's a lot of things we need to be doing at the same time, and I'm not sure it's an either-or solution. Dorothy, if you could. Yeah. So, uh, that's quite an interesting question. Uh, would IL, ILR on its own resolve all these difficulties? I don't believe that it would. I think that we have to have a shift in our understanding of the way in which these cases are dealt with. I think we traditionally, the view was between lawyers that the matter was only between Crown and Defence when it got into court. Now there is a very strong uh, legislative basis for identifying victims have rights, and these are enforceable rights. And that is the starting point, that is crown defence, but the victims have rights that are legally enforceable and should be recognised. Independent legal representation is something that would assist, there's no doubt about that, because the complainer herself in a rape case, we'd have somebody speaking on her behalf at such stages in the cases where they're dealing with very complex legal issues around the admissibility or otherwise of evidence. And she will be given advice about that and she will be taken through the process so that by the time it gets to her trial, she will know that the questions that are going to be asked of her have been considered and will be legally sound. And she will have been supported through that process. But in addition to that, there has to be a cultural shift in the way in which these cases are dealt with. And there has to be a wider education of society at large as to what happens in these cases and the way in which rape myths continue to undermine the whole process. That fundamentally is what has to change. The change of society's understanding of what happens to a woman in a situation where she's raped. And they need to discard all these age-old prejudices that have so undermined the prosecution of sexual crime in Scotland. Yeah, um, I, I really couldn't have put that bit better myself. I, I think we can make procedural changes that will lessen the trauma and give complainers maybe more of a sense of agency. Um, but if you like, the, the, the reason complainers report in the first place, presumably, is because they want a conviction or they want to have some sense of justice. And I, I think unless we really grapple with the question of jury decision making and attitudes, we, we are not going to have any impact on conviction rates. And Sharon said earlier that the conviction rate for rape and attempted rape is the lowest of any crime type. Um, I, I do think if you look at single rape charges, 
but there's a single complainer, it will be much, much lower than that because I, I, I think that's what one overall category that includes multiple complainer cases, mood of cases, domestic abuse cases, where I think the conviction rate is much higher. I think it will be even lower if we get to single rape cases. And that, that really, I think, has a, a fundamental um, lack of justice um, for for complainers in, in these cases. Um, we're, we're waiting on the outcome of Lady Doreen's review of the management of sexual offences, um, which, as far as I understand it, is imminent. And I, I really hope that that will be taking a holistic um, look at these issues because the other two panellists are correct. There's not going to be one solution to really what I think is quite a deep-rooted um, issue that every jurisdiction in the world grapples with is how how to um, effectively provide justice, legal justice, fallen rape. Um, so I think we just need to wait and see what comes out of that review. But I think it's a multi-strand approach that, that we need. That's great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to quick, quickly sneak in one last question. Um, and this, I think I'm going to ask Sharon if she um, can answer this. There's a specific question about, is there also in, any information on the gender of complainers and the applications of Section 275? And the question is really, is this as much as an, as much an issue for male complainers as it is for women? <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, actually, I'm not sure whether Sandy might be better placed to answer that question than me. The the statistics that we looked at did not have a gender breakdown to them. Clearly, um, there are, there are um, also cases of sexual assault that affect men um, as well as women, and um, so their sexual offences are not confined to you know women as complainers, women as victims, survivors. Um, they affect uh, everyone in society. Um, so, uh, but I can't tell you from the statistics that we looked at what, what the gender breakdown was. I don't know if Sandy has those figures. No, uh, the, the data is, is very, very poor. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have a breakdown e even of how many trials is that a female complainer as opposed to a male complainer? No, never mind um, in relation to sexual history applications. But I think it would be a really interesting exercise because, as, as I say, my sense is a lot of the sexual history applications are rooted in notions around women's sexuality so, uh, and behaviour more generally. So it'd be really interesting to see how does that compare in cases with, with male complainers? What is the level, but also what is the nature? Um, of 275 applications. So, good, good question. We, we need better data. I would say that in terms of the issues I raised about procedural issues around implementation of rights. If there is no system of counting how many in how many cases um, is there an application to introduce somebody's um, sensitive records and how many cases does a, compl does a complainer in receive intimation and how many cases um, are they represented? That, that's the only way I think we can make sure that rights are being enforced is if we have proper data. That's great. Um, I, uh, there's so much more that could be said on this, um, but we have now officially run out of time and I'm not sure if we automatically get switched off or not. So I'm going to quickly um, thank everyone for joining. I hope you've all enjoyed um, and got something from this webinar. Um, please give us your feedback on how this has gone. Um, as I said earlier, it's our second one. Uh, we're keen to keep learning how to do this better. Um, but before we sign off um, or get shut down, I would just like to express my thanks again to our panel, Sharon, Dorothy and Sandy. Thanks so much for taking the time to come um, and speak to us all today. And um, a shout out to Cameron and Charlotte, who've been working away in the background to organise the whole seminar um, and have made sure that it's worked um, really well. So thank you very much for that. Um, one last kind of bit of information is that the, Scot the EHRC Scotland legal team, um, they have a e-bulletin and that is circulated um, every couple of months, which has information about our work, um, interesting case law and developments, and also information about future events. So if you want to sign up to that to get more information about um, these sort of issues then, and these events, please um, sign up to our e-bulletin. Um, so I think that's everything from me. Thanks again to everybody. Um, that's been great. I think just say bye now. <laughs> bye. <laughs>